Vandaag bij Antwoorden met Belis Conley. And God is a good God. He is true to his character. He is faithful. He is good. God is love and he never changes. Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Bayless Conley. In chapter 10, verse 1. My soul loathes my life. I'll give free course to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Show me why you contend with me. Does it seem good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands and smile on the counsel of the wicked? Everybody say, uh-oh. Okay, Job has moved now from the, the point where he hasn't sinned with his lips. He said, okay, God, why don't you talk to me? Is it good? You think it's good to oppress people? And you smile on the counsel of the wicked, you reward bad people, and here you're crushing me. Job specifically accuses God of oppressing him. Verse 7, although you know that I am not wicked, and there is no one who can deliver from your hand. And now this next friend in chapter 11 looks at him and says, Job, you're a liar. And you deserve worse. Can you imagine? But that's what he did. He said, God should do more to you, you liar. And then we come to chapter 16. And this is sort of Job's overall response to the help of his friends. Verse 1, then Job answered and said, I've heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. You know, I was doing a meeting out of town, and this was, I don't know, a couple years after I'd had the boating accident. Um, many of you prayed for me. Thank you for doing that. Put my family through a really, really rough patch. They didn't expect me to live, but here I am. This guy comes up to me. I never met him before. I'm greeting people after the meeting. He comes up. He says, I just want to tell you, I know why you had the boating accident. I said, really? <laughs> He says, oh, yes. So God was punishing you. And then he names this specific sin. I said, well, God wasn't punishing me, and eh, wrong, I didn't do that. <laughs> and I got so mad at the guy. You know, and he just stood there so smug. And saying, that's why that happened to you. That's why you almost lost your life. That's why your family went through all that grief. That's why you spent all the time in the hospital. God was punishing you because of ABC. And I, I was so frustrated with the guy. I said, look, we are done. And I just turned my back. I don't ever remember turning my back on anybody like that before, but I just turned around. I wouldn't even talk to the guy anymore. But that's what Job's friends are doing to him. Job, it's because you did this, it's because you did that, and that God is punishing you. And Job says, oh, you're just a bunch of miserable comforters. Look in verse 11 of chapter 16. God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over to the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he shattered me. He also has taken me by the neck and has shaken me to pieces. He set me up for his target. His archers surround me. He pierces my heart and does not pity. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with wound upon wound. He runs at me like a warrior. I've sewn sackcloth over my skin. I laid my head in the dust. My face is flushed from weeping. And on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Although no violence is in my hands and my prayer is pure. O oh, earth, do not cover my blood. And let my cry have no resting place. Surely even now my witness is in heaven and my evidence is on high. My friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. Job is saying, I'm innocent. And heaven knows I'm innocent. If I could just find a mediator so that I could meet with God, someone that would plead my case. 
chapter 22. Well, actually, in chapter 22, Eliphaz, his friend, gets real specific with certain sins. Job, it's because you did this to widows. You did this to orphans. It was all a lie. But he started accusing him of specific things that Job never did. Go to chapter 23. Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Now he's talking about God. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me with his great power? No. He would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Think about this. Job has moved from not sinning with his lips to saying, if I could just find God, I'd tell him what I think. Would he be able to answer me? No, because I'm right and he's wrong. And I'd find deliverance from my judge. He wouldn't be able to answer a word to me once he heard what I had to say. This is how much Job has devolved from the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many think his tune has changed a little bit? It most definitely has. And come with me to chapter 32. We're going to skip a bit because the, the dialogue goes back and forth, back and forth between these guys. In chapter 32, a young man named Elihu shows up. He apparently came some, sometime during the seven Days of silence at the beginning. He was a young man. He said, look, I didn't think I should say anything because all you guys are old. And I thought, you know, an older person should be wise, but you guys are not wise. And he looks at Job's friends and he says this to them in verse 12. I played, paid close attention to you and surely not one of you convinced Job or answered his words. None of you gave him an answer for his questions. And then... In verse 18, he said, For I'm full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It's ready to burst like new wineskins. I'll speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. He's basically saying, the Holy Spirit is moving me to say something. And indeed, Elihu does say some things on the behalf of God. Now, this is the first sound doctrine we come to in the book of Job because he is speaking by the Holy Spirit. Come with me, if you would, to verse 8. Surely, he's talking to Job, surely you've spoken in my hearing and I've heard the sound of your word saying, I'm pure, without transgression. I'm innocent and there's no iniquity in me. Yet he finds occasion against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stock. He watches all my paths. All right, stop there. Look up here. So Elihu basically boils down what Job has said. Job, number one, you say you're totally innocent. And number two, you say God's made himself your enemy and he's put your feet in the stock. It's a metaphor. He's the one that's been wailing on you. Now look at the next thing Elihu says on behalf of God. The very next verse, verse 12. Look, in this you are not righteous. Most translations just put it more simple. Job, in this you are not right. You are not totally innocent, and God is not the one that's put your feet in the stocks. He is not your enemy. You do have an adversary. We read about him in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and it wasn't God. Job, you're not right. I'll answer you, for God is greater than man. Look with me, if you would, in chapter 34, verse 10. Elihu says this, Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to commit iniquity. Look in chapter 37. Or actually, look at in, in chapter 34. Look at verse 35. It's what Elihu says by the Spirit about Job. Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without wisdom. 
Should we use Job's statements as New Testament doctrine? No, he spoke without knowledge and without wisdom. Look with me, if you would, in chapter 37, verse 23, an important statement. Again, Elihu speaking by the Holy Spirit. Verse 23, chapter 37, As for the Almighty, we cannot find Him. He's excellent in power, in judgment and abundant justice. He does not oppress. Job said, God, you've oppressed me. You smile on the counts of the wicked. You're my oppressor. And Elihu, speaking by the Spirit, said, God does not oppress. The New Living Translation or New Living Testament says, God does not destroy us. I feel some people are like one. Keep an open heart, friend. This could change your life forever. Now in chapter 38, guess who comes on the scene? God personally comes on the scene in chapter 38, and God personally begins to ask Job some questions. Chapter 38 and 1, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Job, you don't know what you've been talking about. Verse 3, now prepare yourself like a man, and I'll question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched, out, who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Look at verse 16. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. God goes on in chapter 39. God asks Job a whole bunch of questions about nature, and Job can't answer a single question. We come to chapter 40, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Verse 3. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Smartest thing Job has done in a while <laughs> is he shut his mouth. But he hasn't repented yet. And so in chapter 41, God questions him further. We come to chapter 42, final chapter in the book. Verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I'll question you, and you shall answer me. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job repents. Listen, what's about to happen next is amazing. But if you become bitter at God, maybe because of wrong doctrine, misinformation, you've blamed God for all of your problems, like Job did. Maybe you've thought, well, God has been so cruel to me because of my mistakes and because of my sin and I deserve all this, and that's why God has done it. Or maybe you've been in that boat saying, God, why? Can't you just leave me alone? Can't something go right in my life just for once? God, why? 
and bitterness has found its way into your heart. There are so many people like that. You'll never find freedom. You'll never find deliverance until you repent. God is not your problem, my friend. And now Job says, look, I've spoken with that knowledge. God, you're right. I didn't know what I was talking about. Everything I said is wrong. And I repent. Now look at this amazing thing that happens next. In verse 7, so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temnite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. Now wait a minute. God, you just got through saying that Job didn't know what he was talking about that everything he said was wrong. Job confessed that what he said was wrong. Now you're telling his friends, you haven't spoken to me what's right as my servant Job? Ah, but wait. Job has just repented. God now has no record of any wrong thing he has done, of any wrong thing he has said. What a beautiful picture of the forgiveness of God that when we confess our sin, when we repent, God has no more record of it. All he has record of is of the good. He no longer remembers the bad. But don't miss the fact that God said to these guys, hey, what you've said is wrong. Verse 8, let's read on. This just gets better and better. Verse 8, now therefore take yourselves seven bulls, seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Timnite, Bildad the Shuhite, the short guy, Zophar the Namathite, went and did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord had accepted Job. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Look at verse 12. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Drop all the way down, if you would, to the last couple of verses. After this, Job lived a hundred to 140 years and saw his children, his grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. James in the New Testament says that's what we should be getting from the book. God is merciful. God is kind. We see what the Lord did to Job or for Job in the end. Now, how did Job receive his healing, his deliverance? Some quick things. Number one, Job got in a position for things to turn around. Number one, because he saw God's greatness. God called Job's attention to his creation and his power, to the universe that he had made. We didn't take time to read it all. But God pointed Job to creation. Up to that point, Job had been consumed with his troubles, his afflictions, and his sufferings. And if you're in trouble, if you're suffering, if you're ill, the first thing you need to do is get your eyes off of your problems and get your eyes on the greatness of God. Look at the scriptural record. Think about the story of Abraham. He's struggling with his faith. God, is it this servant of mine that you want to bring a son to me? You promised me a son. It hasn't happened. God says, Abraham, come outside. Look up, what do you see? God, I see millions of stars. The Lord said, so shall your offspring be. And they suddenly turned into the faces of millions of little babies crying out, Father Abraham. And the very next verse says, Abraham believed God. The scripture says, the heavens declare the glory of God. When's the last time you just went out and laid under the stars and thought about how big and how powerful and how grand our God is. 
Job saw God's greatness. Number two, Job stopped questioning God and he stopped accusing God of injustice. That is so important. You may not understand everything that's going on, but don't accuse God of unfairness. Job only could see this much of something that was very vast. Our view is a little wider, but it's still quite narrow, my friend. And God is a good God. He is true to his character. He is faithful. He is good. God is love, and he never changes. There's not the slightest shadow of turning with him. Number three, instead of talking so much, Job started listening. He started listening to God. Chapter after chapter after chapter, Job is jabbering. Finally, he gets quiet. And he listens to God speaking through Elihu. And then he opens his ear to God's voice personally. Number four, Job stopped being negative. He had cursed the day of his birth, questioned about why he'd been born. He talked weakness, disaster, fear, and misery, and it came to him in truckloads. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. And I know some of us, you know, we've got a propensity toward one thing or another that's, that's not healthy. There are some that have a propensity toward talking negative. Number five, Job confessed and repented from his self-righteousness and his prideful attitude. See, Job had been looking to his own good works as a reason to be healed and a reason to be set free. Friend, it's not by our good works. It's by God's grace alone. Humility and repentance are great steps toward healing, deliverance, and freedom. And then finally, we're almost done here. Sixth and finally, Job prayed for his friends. Job's communion with God had been restored. And now his communion with his friends need to be restored. Two questions God asked in the book of Genesis, where are you? Where's your brother? Still very important questions today. And you know, this couldn't have been easy for Job. These guys have sat there. There's 10 fresh graves that have been dug. Job is sicker than any person they've ever seen. He's unrecognizable. Everything he has is gone. We've talked about it a lot. And they accuse him of being wicked, being a liar, being a hypocrite. They say he deserves worse. And now they come to Job and say, Job, pray for us. All right. God, break their legs. Give them a taste of what they've been dishing out. No, Job didn't do that. Do you know, some of you, there are people that have really done you wrong. Some of you have been betrayed. That doesn't mean you have to have close fellowship with that person, but you need to have a clean heart. Jesus said, bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. It's really where the rubber meets the road. You see, Job never received healing or deliverance as long as he prayed to die or protested his innocence or his goodness. He was healed when he saw God's greatness and his own smallness. When he humbled himself, God met him. When he prayed for the deliverance of others, he received his own. Stand to your feet if you would. I'd like the band to go ahead and come out. I hope that some people in their thinking have had a massive shift tonight. Because as long as we believe that God is our problem, that God is the one afflicting us, we are not in a position to receive freedom from Him. Wrong thinking leads to wrong believing. God is for you, my friend. You know, when we read the entire book of Job, it is so liberating. 
And I pray that you've stayed with us through the whole series. For some people, this truly is a massive shift in their theological view because it, it, it paints the picture, the real picture, that God is not our problem, that he is not the one afflicting us, that he is good. And you know, Job made all these statements about God, but at the end of the story, he said, I put my hand on my mouth, I've spoken without knowledge. My friend, he is good and he is for you. And I just want to encourage you, if you were not in on the entire series that we did on the book of Job, go to our YouTube channel and you should listen to all of them. Don't skip anything. It'll be a blessing to you. It'll be time well spent. So go to the YouTube channel. Just take the time out to listen to the entire series on the book of Job. It will encourage you. You'll grow spiritually. And hey, my time is up, so I will see you next time. Heb je een uitzending van Belis Condi gemist? Op zijn website kun je op elk moment alle preken online terugkijken. Ga naar belis-condi.nl slash mediatheek. Loop je met vragen rond over hoe je je problemen kunt overwinnen? Ontdek met Belis Condi de Bijbelse antwoorden hierop. Going through trials right now, maybe with your health, your finances, at work, some other arena. You can still be used by God to meet the needs of others, to strengthen others, and to encourage others. And it's an important lesson to learn that God needs to be the wind in your sails. He doesn't just work when you're feeling tip-top, friend. God is God regardless of what is going on in our lives. Abonneer je op ons YouTube kanaal. Bedankt voor het kijken naar Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Ga naar belis-conley.nl voor meer informatie en inspiratie. Ga jij nu door een moeilijke periode en vraag je je af wanneer God zal antwoorden en je uit jouw nood zal helpen? Blijf hoop houden. God zal niet van jouw zijde wijken. De Bijbel is filled met stories van mensen that experience crisis and, and hard situations, but it's also filled with answers that came from God. It's also filled with stories of God intervening in, in their lives and helping them, and I believe He wants to help you. In het boekje Waar is God in moeilijke tijden? van Belis Conley vind je hier meer over. Er zijn vier praktische stappen in het boek beschreven die je zullen helpen om moeilijke tijden te overwinnen en opnieuw je hoop op God te vestigen. Met een speciale prijs. Bestel online of bel ons.